So um, I have prepared a lengthy speech with multiple PowerPoint slides, something to really energize the crowd. And then I thought, no, we probably better do something different. Now, we've had some great presentations earlier uh, in this day so far, and I expect we'll have great ones for the next couple of days. Uh, I just want to try to add to our aspirational beliefs of where we can go with the collective brain power that's within this room and what we've all experienced and what we can do to change some of the things that, we, that exist currently in our lives when it comes to recovery. So I come today with this um, kind of heaviness in my heart um, because fire is impacting more and more communities around the country. Uh, I'm also from wildland fire country. Uh, I'm a Nevadan. Uh, I live in Washoe County. Uh, that's northern Nevada, uh, where we've got the largest area of our wildland and urban interface uh, in our state. Now, you know our state's known for, uh, everybody, when I say I'm from Nevada, they go, oh, I've been to Las Vegas. Well, there's more to Nevada than Las Vegas. Uh, but uh, we have a very, very large urban interface area. And uh, on Saturday, this past Saturday, uh, we had a fire start in one of our areas. Uh, that fire has now grown to roughly 6,000 acres. Uh, it has now taken 14 homes. We haven't lost any lives yet, uh, but for those of you familiar with the, the Reno area, uh, the valley is full of, of smoke and Mount Rose is on fire and it's pretty devastating right now. Um, despite the fact that over the last 20 years, since we had a fire in that area previously, um, we've done a lot of work to mitigate against uh, home loss. Uh, there's, there been a, we've been allowing homes to be built, but they had to go in there and really take good care of them and, and really create some defensible space. You know the drill. Uh, and the good news is the homes that we've saved all had that defensible space. They all were built to the right standards and codes, and we were able to protect them. So as Jen said, I've been an emergency manager for quite some time now in, in public service for about 29 years. And I've been a part of lots of presidential declared disasters. I've been a part of even hundreds more state and local emergencies. And the one thing that remains constant that I see consistently is that human suffering and pain leaves an indelible mark on our souls and what we do. And it leaves that mark on survivors as well. You can never forget the stories that people tell you. And it is so important, I'm so glad you mentioned, that listening to people's stories is the most important way that we can start to heal. But those stories and the way that people look when they're telling those stories and the loss that they demonstrate in their eyes drives me to help them find that path to recover. You know, I bet we've all heard the same stories and, and similar stories and heard survivors say some of the same types of things. And one of them that resonates with me is, I never thought it was gonna happen to me. I've seen it, but it's never gonna happen to me. And I just wanna put a pin in that for a little bit later on. So today, as Jen mentioned, I, I serve as a disaster consultant. Um, and part of my prior work, I was able to serve uh, the nation. Like when Brock got a call, I got a call to come to, the, to FEMA headquarters to serve as the director of individual assistance. Um, to tell you the truth, safe space, right? Yeah? I, I couldn't spell individual assistance when I went to FEMA headquarters. Uh, they, I, I went there to lead people and to cause and to bring about a feeling of caring in the organization. Uh, there are many, many people in the United States who don't know anything about the individual assistance program, and today is not that speech. So raise your hand, though, so let me know, do you, who's heard of individual assistance before? Yes, okay, good. So we've got some, most folks in the room know what IA is. I'm going to refer to it as IA for brevity. Um, this is a federal program 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, that it is tied to a major presidential declaration, as Barack was indicating. There are two types. There's a FEMA IA deck, and there's a FEMA PA, or Public Assistance Declaration. And they can be combined to be a FEMA PA and IA deck. Um, so FEMA provides this assistance across the board to states that are that receive this major disaster declaration. Many states also have individual assistance programs. Okay? So a state could have their own program, doesn't need a federal program to, to run it. Only about a quarter of the states have some semblance of an IA program. Uh, and they provide really minimal baseline levels of funding. So it's not, this isn't life-changing stuff by any means, but some states do have some level of assistance they can provide to, to disaster survivors if it's not a federalized event. So when we think about individual assistance in, a, in, in totality, I like to think about it as uh, many, many different things. But one of them is it's, a, it's an attempt for uh, community mass economic stabilization. So Congress created a way to provide large amounts of money to be injected into a community, into the people in that community, and provide financial assistance to those directly affected by the disaster. And in order for that state to be considered for individual assistance, there's got to be a combination of, uh, you know, exceptional damages and, as Brock indicated too, uninsured loss. Well, let's just assume for argument's sake that public assistance, or sorry, that we was, a state was get, issued an individual assistance declaration for today's discussion. There are six Stafford Act elements that make up the IA program, okay? There is the Individuals and Households Program, that's the money one, that's the one we're gonna talk about. There's disaster case management, that's the confusing one that Jen mentioned that's, uh, that baffles everybody. There's the Crisis Counseling Program, there's disaster unemployment, there's disaster legal services, and in the palm of that hand, it's mass care provided by public assistance. So I often refer to this as the helping hand of the federal government. This was the coolest job to have to be the IA director because we were able to support communities with these authorities. Now, as we talk about the Individuals and Households Program, basic level stuff here, I'm not diving into it, but I've got to, dive, I've got to talk about some baseline stuff here. Survivors may be eligible for a few types of funding. Immediate needs funding, which is meant to provide emergency cash for clothing, hotel rooms, gas, it's a quick shot. There's not a, a large requirement for uh, proving damages or anything like that. It's, a, it's just a, a shot that gives money to an individual who's been impacted or who's had to evacuate from uh, a disaster area. FEMA could also provide rental assistance. Uh, if that home is not habitable, they can provide assistance. Many of you know this, especially those of you coming to this conference from Maui, uh, that FEMA can provide that assistance for up to 18 months. And that's fair market rent established by HUD. So that in and of itself is, is a pretty good benefit. States also can receive, or individuals can receive repair assistance. So you can repair your home. That's great if there's something to repair. People can also get personal property assistance to replace these essential elements that they might have lost in the home. And prior to just a couple of months ago, you had to apply for an SBA loan, get denied from that loan, and then you're eligible for that assistance. That's now changed, so that doesn't happen anymore. FEMA can also provide to the state and to the survivors direct housing, which is housing for 18 months in the form of whatever really FEMA needs it to be. It could be an RV, it could be manufactured housing, it could be prop up housing very quickly, it could be a direct lease, it could be direct repair and, and replacement, and that usually only occurs outside of the continental United States. So I describe all those things to you for a, a specific purpose, and that is to really lay down the fact that those are great things if I'm a survivor of a flood, or if I'm a survivor from a hurricane, or if I'm a survivor from a derecho, uh, or if I'm a survivor from a tornado, perfect. But those things don't necessarily help me if I'm a wildland fire survivor. And so I think this is the challenge now that we've got to come up with uh, because there is no repair for a total loss. 
There is no muck and gut. Anybody familiar with mucking and gutting? Yeah, some of you have had hurricane work, yeah. So there is no muck and gut activity that's out there for after a devastating fire. There are likely no home rentals and certainly not enough in reasonable commuting dis distances when we deal with these mega fires. And certainly, even if there's a case for direct housing, if we've got a great articulation for it, there will likely not be any infrastructure that's available very quickly to help those who've been impacted by the disaster moving into a, a, a provided direct housing opportunity within the next six months, realistically, six to probably eight months. That's the reality on the ground when it comes to um, disaster assistance that's being currently provided by the federal government. All of those offerings take time, and that ultimately risks the economic viability of the communities that we're trying to stabilize and ultimately recover from. So that's kind of the FEMA program in a nutshell. Not a lot for survivors of fires, for sure. And that's why I think government has more of a responsibility than I think what we're currently leveraging. Now think about this. If what we have in our collective experiences based in disaster response and recovery and leverage that to manifest a more effective recovery-based disaster experience, uh, experience, disaster assistance experience for survivors, that would be tremendous. Some of the things I'm about to say you may not agree with, some of the things you might. Uh, that's all good. My hope is, is that it starts to stimulate some conversation and action about how we can come together and bring about change for the people that we're trying to serve that have been impacted by disaster. So, a couple other baselines that I want to think about. Uh, the role of government. We all might have a different perspective about what the role of government should or should not be. In disaster recovery, it takes on many different shapes and sizes currently. Uh, it's based on the government's capability. It's based on the government's authority. And I'm not just talking about federal government. I'm talking about state government, local government, tribal government. What authority, what capability, what ideology might exist there, and tons of other inputs that really drive what the role of government could and should be. Government must assume the role that they may or may not be ready for when the disaster strikes. So a few key elements that government should probably pay attention to. Response. Response focus on saving lives and stabilizing the incident. We should expect that from our government, to be able to coalesce the first responders and make sure that that is an element that is going to exist in every one of our communities. Government should also be able to think about short-term recovery stabilizing the community, stabilizing that tax base, limiting flight from our impacted areas, and thinking more for setting that foundation for long-term recovery, which will focus on some rebuilding. Oftentimes, government knows what they need to do, but they've not synced these actions with their partners before the disaster happens. And so what then occurs is we've got the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing, and then suddenly we're causing confusion and delay. Anybody ever watch Thomas the Train or their kids show Thomas the Train? Confusion and delay was one of my most favorite lines from that show because it is exactly what emergency managers live every single day. So we talked a little bit about government and what some of our baseline government expectations could and should be. And then let's look at like survivors and what the survivor experience, what we think survivor experiences could and should be as well. So survivors, right off the bat, we don't know where to turn. Nobody is a disaster expert when it happens. We don't do a great job of, of coaching folks up to understand what way do I go? What, what, what benefit do I accept? What benefit do I not accept? And that causes confusion and oftentimes distrust. Many times survivors don't have the ability to rebuild for a variety of different reasons. Construction labor, permitting, funding, whatever it is. Rebuilding is gonna be a difficult process. Some don't have insurance or they're underinsured. And then most importantly, I think I see this a lot in every disaster, it's really common, the disaster recovery fatigue from government. The overwhelming amount of information push, 
and community meetings, and you got to fill out this form, and you got to you got to call this number. All of those things trigger survivors and makes us relive these things over and over and over again. So we've got to have an experience where we build a new path for a survivor. So I have seven key principles that I think of when I think about what we could do anew for survivors in disasters. We could create a system that's very responsive. That's the R. We could enhance state roles. That's the E, enhance state roles. We could improve our survivor support. That's the S. We can provide, get the private sector more engaged, not in response, but in recovery. That's the P. We can have effective accessibility to our programs. That's the E. The C is community resilience, and T is timeliness. We have to bring respect back to the survivor and bring that about in a way that we can all get behind it and move forward in a new direction, which is giving the survivor what they need right off the bat instead of making them dance on one leg and spin around three times before you're allowed to pass over the bridge that the troll lives at, the FEMA troll that lives there and does that work. I understand I, I was once the FEMA troll, I get it. So the R in responsiveness. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, of course time is of the essence. And the goal is that we've gotta get that assistance mobilized, the right assistance mobilized at the right time. It doesn't do us any good to bring you a couch when you have no place to put the couch. So get the right assistance at the right time for the individuals that need it. Streamline the process. A simplified application that gives you the basics and the approval pr procedures that we can get done very quickly for a survivor so that we can move them into a place to receive benefits is the right place to be. State and fire disaster declarations or state and fire emergency declarations happen very, very quickly. And we can build a program and process that enables survivors at the state level, at the local level, to start to apply for assistance. And we can even, dreaming big here, make data shareable so that we can actually take it, an application that we receive at the local level and not make the survivor have to apply, apply again at each level of government, but try to really coincide to have an application that can work at any level of government to get you at least in the door. There might be more information that has to come in down the line, but I think we can overcome that. The bottom line is we're trying to be responsive to our survivors. I think the leverage, leveraging of, of um, artificial intelligence, something that I might need right now, is something really to help us predict uh, potential disasters and the, the impacts of disaster on our communities. So as a point in case, most recently, uh, there was some AI analysis done of traffic evacuation routes out of the Lake Tahoe Basin, which is right there where I live, uh, and how to get folks out of that basin. It's a, it's a really, for those of you who haven't been there, please come and check, check it out, it's beautiful. Uh, for those of you who have, it is, it, is a, it is a remarkable place that we worry about people getting stuck in that basin, because there are only four ways out. And if any of those ways are blocked, it's going to create a tremendous amount of chaos, confusion, and delay, and potentially a lot of, of devastation. And because of that, this AI report came out of kind of left field, and, and, and the local government officials had no visibility on that, and it's challenging their belief system now. But I think that challenge is okay. It challenges us to really do what's right for the people that we serve, and ultimately, we don't want to have challenges at, that, uh, at the Lake Tahoe Basin when people have to evacuate out of there. So I like the infusion of artificial intelligence to help us think about things that we, be, we don't see already or that we've become kind of immune to. Um, enhancing state roles and local, state and local roles. So state and local responsibilities play a crucial part of disaster preparedness and response. What they haven't done so much so is recovery. We've not, we've, they've really, states for the most part look at recovery, especially on their survivor side, as either it's not a disaster, it's the VOADs who are gonna take care of it, 
or FEMA is going to take care of it. But we as a state really just don't own that. And I think that's got to change. States have to start to take more ownership in, I call it focused disaster survivor coordination, making sure that there's somebody who's linking up with the federal agencies to train the state and localities within the state to help them understand what disaster response and recovery is really going to look like. Mayor Bisson mentioned the overwhelming flow of federal resources that comes into a community at, at a disaster. I call that the tsunami of federal assistance. And it, it is overwhelming uh, as a local emergency manager, as a one person shop, I have a federal declaration. And the next day I have all these people coming at me, asking me thousands of questions that I have no idea what the answer is, but I've got to go up several layers of government to get that answer. It's not productive. And that kind of an overwhelming thing can be mitigated if the state can help train up those individuals who are working with it. Um, I'm gonna move a little bit farther along because I've been talking too much and I have eight minutes left and I wanna make sure I stay on the clock because we do that. Yeah, I know. So, survivor support. Individualized recovery benefits based on needs. Let's not give away things that you don't need. Let's make sure you get what you do need at the right time. So changing up the way that we are offering disaster assistance at the federal level and even at the state level to provide those funds at the right time so that we don't put people into a vicious cycle of, well, you didn't use the money for the right reason and therefore we can't give you anything more. I see a lot of heads going north and south there and I think that's a big one. Let's give the survivors money that they need at the right time so they can spend it on the right stuff. Uh, I believe that every survivor should have a recovery plan. Every survivor should have a recovery plan. Uh, I come from the classroom where we used to teach, we were told to teach at like center mass at the target and those high kids weren't gonna get a lot of their education and the low kids weren't gonna get a lot of education. Those were, those were the old school days, Jen. Uh, but now I believe we should have an individualized recovery plan for every individual who receives federal assistance or state assistance. We gotta be able to help them through and navigate that. There is no two ways about that. Um, private sector engagement, uh, big things here include public and private partnerships, which are fantastic, but they tend to only exist in response and maybe even preparedness. I don't see them really manifesting into those longer term recovery areas. And I think that's an area for growth for our country. I believe that uh, business continuity planning in a way that helps really focus on recovery of not only the business, but also for the community itself and what that business is a part of is an important integral part of how we focus on uh, disaster recovery in communities. Um, workforce training. Brock talked a little bit about it. I'm gonna speak a little bit about it. I think that partnering with businesses to provide disaster preparedness uh, and recovery training to their employees is critical. Again, we're not teaching people how to recover. We're teaching people how to respond. We're teaching people how to prepare. But we say nothing about what recovery really means and what that's going to be like. And I think all of us in this room can attest, recovery is where the hard work really takes place. All of it is about really helping that community rebuild and recover. And that takes time. And that's not sexy. Um, accessibility. We've got to do a great job of providing multilingual, multimodal support to individuals who've experienced disasters and in multiple languages, create it so that there is not a gap of people who didn't know how to provide, uh, apply for assistance or didn't know about what information to get or where to get that information. At no point now moving on should we ever be assuming that in this country, we're only gonna have one language that we're gonna speak to. We've got to move beyond that and build our programs to be designed to have multiple languages that we can support people in. Um, I recently learned of a, uh, of a state-run disaster resource center, um, and this, uh, this disaster resource center was located at the northern part of the county, and the impact area was at the southern part of the county, and that just happened to be about 45 miles apart, and, and they did that because it was free. The, the building was free, and they didn't have to, to, to pay for it. Well, nobody went to that facility. And so the people who really needed the assistance weren't getting that assistance because they didn't have cars to begin with. So we've got to think more about who we're serving and where we serve and how we're going to get that service to them. So having mobile uh, assistance centers 
rotating them to where the people are makes a lot more sense than having them have to navigate their way all the way across the county. Uh, community resilience. A big part of this is, uh, is, is planning. Resilience is not an accident. You've got to have your plans in place. A pre-disaster recovery plan should be in, in place in every community, especially every wildland fire community in this country, to know what you expect to do when that fire happens and how you're going to recover from it is something that we should do. We don't do it, but it should happen more and more. And so FEMA has got to, could incentivize us to, to get those plans in place. Uh, I will also say that uh, community education is a huge part of what I believe. We don't do a great job of educating our public, our, our homeowners, our renters, our students. As a teacher, I spent a lot of time teaching people about the Donner Party and what happened in the winter of, uh, uh, as they crossed over the, the Sierra and how they got stuck. Yeah, that's important, but not as important as teaching somebody how to respond to somebody that might have a heart attack in front of them and then how to respond and recover from a disaster that we know that community is uh, susceptible to. Yeah, we've got blizzards in Northern Nevada, but not like they used to have them during the Donner Party. So I'm not too worried about that anymore. We should worry about other things. Um, I'm gonna wrap this up. Uh, yeah, I, I will start with, I'll, I'll go to timeliness first. So they don't have respect without the T. So timeliness. Rapid needs assessments, getting information from survivors right off the bat, teaching them how to give us the information that we can use to help them is an important part of that. So developing a system to give survivors an opportunity to report what they might need immediately so that we can provide that to them is a way that we can move ahead more quickly. Or more quickly. Uh, streamlining our financial assistance, as I said, developing community support networks, uh, mobilizing local community-based organizations, teaching them how to do recovery before the disaster actually happens. It's too late after the disaster to start to teach somebody about what recovery is and how to do it. We've got to have these conversations ahead of time. So in closing, I know that many of these concepts aren't novel, uh, but they're reframed based on our experiences that, and that may have become tired or forgotten. Disaster survivor assistance is about more than just responding to crisis. It's about building a resilient, inclusive, supportive framework that empowers survivors and rebuilds communities stronger than before. As we think about fire, I believe our paradigm must evolve. We have an excellent response capability, as I mentioned. We practice response. We focus on response. Response is all over social media. It's all over TV. Uh, there were TV shows about response when I was a kid. Emergency 51 and SWAT were the reasons why I became a first responder. I wanted to be those guys in that truck and those things doing that work. That was cool. But what we don't have is a TV show about disaster recovery. Could you imagine what that would look like? I can too. So in this week's episode, Chris tries to file an appeal with FEMA and the city of Reno is trying to get a public assistance project approved uh, by the nasty state uh, grant personnel that won't approve it, but says, bring me another rock because it's not the rock that I'm looking for. And so we've got to start that application over again. Yeah, that's not a good episode, right? But that's the reality of this all, that we, we don't have something where we've not embraced recovery yet to where we, it, we have like response. And until we start to make that focus and that shift to build a equal response and recovery, we're gonna still continue to perform response flawlessly and have clumsy recoveries. Our mission should be developing communities to better withstand the challenges of our climate, building better, building smarter in the first place, not just building back better. Together, we can create a safer, more prepared locality, a more prepared state, a more prepared nation. Thank you, Jen, to you and the After the Fire movement. Um, you and the team are champions for evolving how we support people and our communities uh, affected by this devastating threat. To all of you in the room, together we can create a more safe and prepared community that understands that how we recover can make us more resilient. Thank you very much for your time and your attention.
I'll be here all week so we can talk about this some more.